John Ford Coley is the legendary American singer and guitarist, but did you know he is also a classically trained pianist? He is also an actor and an author, and he is most revered as half of the Grammy-nominated duo England Dan and John Ford Coley. Now, many of you remember the iconic songs, Love is the Answer, I'd Really Love to See You Tonight, We'll Never Have to Say Goodbye Again, and many others. But on Spotify alone, over 1.7 million people listen to their songs every month. How's that for timeless memory-making music? Now today, he is still performing on stages around the world as part of the growing appreciation for smooth yacht rock music. I'm still trying to figure out where the term yacht rock came from. But ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome one of the most recognized voices in music rock pop history, John Ford Coley, to the show. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Also, I wanted to tell you that when you were doing the introduction, you forgot to add the most uh, um, brutally handsome and humble and 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 just you. Yeah, don't forget those things. That's well, important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to add that because we know all rock and pop stars are brutally handsome and uh, extremely talented. So I guess you fall into that group. Well, I hope so. I don't know. Yesterday I was at the store and I dropped my card and I bent over and it was kind of a little difficult because it was a tight quarters and there was a young girl. And I said, see, that's what you have to look forward to when you get older, bending over. I said, oh, that and senility. So we can't forget that. Oh my goodness. Well, I've got to ask you, John, because uh, how were you introduced to music when you were growing up? Oh man, I was raised around it. Mom and daddy sang in the choir. Uh, we had school at music at that, uh, uh, we had music in school at that time. So I'm getting Stephen Foster and, and then, you know, all the church music. I was raised on opera, uh, show tunes, watching Judy Garland and Music Man, all those kinds of things, Oklahoma. Uh, I was trained classically as a pianist. So music was not something that was just one style. There was a, a vast variety of music that came in. Well, isn't that really important for people who really want to become a recording artist or a musician that they kind of start, uh, they, they tiptoe in every genre of music to kind of learn the different styles instead of just uh, sticking with one genre and just kind of getting in a rut? I think you have to, because again, the more eclectic you are, the more you've got to bring to the table. Um, I used to watch Elton John. He would go into the record stores and he would leave with African music and Lithuanian music. I mean, he would walk out with so many various styles of music. And you know that that all played uh, or had an influence on how he would write and play. Well, you know, it's kind of funny that you bring that up because I was uh, having a discussion with my daughter uh, one day. We were talking about uh, some of the songs, you know, the classic Elton John songs. And I go, well, don't you like Island Girl? And uh, because a lot of people never bring that song up, but it does have that, you know, that different type of flavor that you would not actually expect to hear from Elton, even back in the day. But right. like you said, it goes back into, you know, researching and listening to all forms of music. And for you, does, did that help in songwriting? Absolutely. Because again, when I sit down and write, I don't think, okay, I'm going to write in this particular style. I'm going to write a country song today. I'm going to write a song with a classical influence. Man, just whatever comes out is what comes out. And the, the fingers and the mind seem to take on a, uh, uh, just a mind of their own in essence, you know, and you just let them go. Well, what do you I, like? Well, what do you like writing songs uh, with? Do you like to sit down at the piano, or do you like to sit down with a guitar? Or I, I, that's or? kind of hey, you know, who do you like the best, your mommy or your daddy? You know, it's it's like I pick them both up, and they're both inspirational. And I'll take the guitars around the house because, again, I'll I'll have them in every room because when I pass by, I'm going to pick them up. But I won't have them all tuned to a standard tuning. One will be in a D, one will be in a G, uh, one's in regular standard tuning. And so, therefore, you, you kind of you pick up different things and you get a different sound and a different inspiration. Well, you know, it's funny that you talk about tunings because I've heard uh, with other, you know, I'm going to say iconic artist. You know, we have a lot of artists today that are in their 60s or 70s, Rolling Stones getting into their 80s. Uh, 
when it when the voice starts to change, do you have to to drop down a key? Uh, I'm very with lucky. The songs? I have not had to drop down a key. I uh, I sing all the time, so therefore you have the muscle memory and the exercise going. Uh, I've been very fortunate. No, nothing drives me more crazy when I play with somebody in Nashville, for example. We do a songwriter in the round, so you've got a, a variety of songwriters, and they're dropped down a half step. And I want to play along, but I'm not that musically gifted to be able to play every song that they do a half step down. Uh, I've just been lucky in that way. Wow, yo, that is absolutely amazing. So that means that when the fans come to see you in concert, they're actually getting to hear what they're used to hearing. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I don't change the style of the song either. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not playing everything down in Lithuanian disco polka beat, you know, or changing <laughs> melodies on things. The people have come to hear a song. They remember it a certain way. They're going to go down memory lane. You can't go down memory lane when you're hearing a new melody to a song that that now you're not recognizing yeah that's very very true now for you was there a particular song that inspired you to become a musician no i think i just had a, a i just had a a need to kind of play music all the time i mean i remember in the sixth grade i'm making up lyrics walking down the hall singing to books that i had read you know it's just something that's in your spirit. You don't have a whole lot of control over it. Uh, one time when I moved to uh, Nashville, my wife said, because I played at a songwriter in the round, and she said, you just can't not do this, can you? And I said, no, I can't. It's just something that's in my blood. Um, well, I just that's like what I was to gonna say. It's, you know, you, you literally are ingrained with a melody just walking around absolutely all the time you hear music you hear songs when i play i play when i'm in the car i don't listen to the radio i don't listen to music cds very often most of the time i've got melodies going in my head so i'm always searching for something new well is there a particular song that you that you've heard that you absolutely love and just sit there and, and think man i wish i would have wrote that uh, there's so many songs. You don't have enough paper for me to write down the songs that I, I should have written. A lot of the things by Dan Fogelberg or Joni Mitchell or Sean Colvin, even Def Leppard. Uh, th th there's a couple of songs by Van Halen. I went, no, I wrote that. <laughs> you know, that's funny that you bring up Dan Fogelberg because I was listening to some of Dan's songs probably just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sitting here thinking... Not only was he, at the time, he was so big, but even today, he's really underrated. Would you say he's that's true? Extraordinarily underrated. Uh, if you listen to, the, to just the volume of, of material that he's got, and you think of him only in these slow songs. That guy was a rocker. He could play some good stuff. And the other day I was quoting to a friend of mine, I said, listen to this lyric, because I'd been listening to it as I was traveling down to Dallas. And it was a song called, uh, oh, gee, what, are Tucson, Arizona? I started quoting the lyrics to her. And she went, holy cow, that is profound. That well, is clever. Dan, went, Dan uh, you know, Dan was a poet. He was very and gifted. And you're right, because, you know, I'd listen to some of the songs and I'm thinking like you like you did. You're hearing a lyric. And you're like, whoa, yep. that's deep. Like, where did that come from? You don't hear that in in normal pop music. I mean, today's pop music. It just sucks. Because, <laughs> there, because, there was a friend of mine. She put up a song the other day and it was a very good song. Very, very intensely lyrical. And I said, you know what? That's a good song, but because you're country, you now you got to cut throw in a couple of things about Taruks and the Rankin and whiskey and a hey girl, you need that. It's like, yeah, geez, come on, give me a break. Well, you know, does it is it a shock to you on how much the music industry has changed, not just behind the scenes, 
in the way labels are run today, but also in the way that songs are placed on the radio and, well, even the way songs are written? Well, I think that you've lost the story. Uh, I miss stories. That, that's what I gravitate to the most. But I will, I will tell you, many, many years ago, I got into an argument with a drummer who used to play with Vic Damone and, and um, you know, the big bands, the jazz bands and things like that, as to which was more important, the music or the lyrics. And I'm arguing for the lyric in the sense that, that it's intelligent. It tells a story. It does something. And he's going, no, it's the music. And we're going back and forth and back and forth. And then finally he said, but John, she buys the records. And he pointed to his 11-year-old daughter. And I went, I'm in deep trouble. <laughs> I go with the lyric every time. Yeah, well, you can have a great lyric and a lousy melody, and you won't have a, you won't have a good song. You can have a miserable lyric and a great melody, and you got a hit. Who knows? I mean, you know, it's like you know, I, it's it's funny you bring that up because there is a balance that has to be met for a song to be likable. You know, to me, as a listener, a hit song to me is. If it's on the radio and you can sing along with it, yeah. that's step number one. If it sticks in your head after you turn off the radio, you got to hit. The way that I've looked at music and it's really saved my sanity is that music, art, uh, entertainment, if you like it, you're right. If you hate it, you're right. It's a value judgment. There are so many songs that I go, on. Oh, Give me a break. And it's a smash. It's the number one around the world. And I'm going, okay, they like it. Well, you know, when, when you and Dan Seals uh, were, were the duo, there was a ton of musical competition out there at that time. I call it the fastest gun in the West syndrome. You're always looking over your shoulder because somebody's going to shoot you in the back. <laughs> and when we would come home off of the road. I, because the fortunate thing for Dan and I is that we toured with everyone in the world as a duo. Bread, Three Dog Night, Carol King, Elton John, Chicago. It just went on down the line. We were always touring. And what I got to do was watch how those guys' career lasted. They would go like this. Some of them would go like this. Most of them went and it's over and you realize it's a very ephemeral business. So when I would come off the road, I'm not going on vacation. I'm not going out, you know, partying and having a good time. I'm in the studio and I'm working and I'm writing because I know there is an end to this and you got to hit it as long as you can. Well, you know, back in the day, you know, record companies, they could be brutal. They you are. Know, I mean, you know, you and Dan, you both uh, started off in a band called Southwest FOB, and you had that one hit, The, the Smell of Incense. Um, and then you ended up on stage with the likes of Led Zeppelin. I mean, how in the world did that happen? <laughs> they were coming through Texas, and uh, in the band, the Southwest FOB, we were fairly popular across the state. Plus, we had the song, uh, Smell of Incense. It was got way up in the charts and it was a regional uh, hit as, as well. So they look for people that can pull in extra tickets. We could pull in extra tickets. So we played with them in Houston and in Dallas. And as a matter of fact, it was funny for me because I did a film several years ago called Scenes from the Gold Mine. And it was Timothy B. Schmidt was the bass player in the band. I was the drummer. We had a lot of good people in the film. So at one point they were talking about people they had played with. And I said, well, you know, Dan and I played with uh, Led Zeppelin. You could hear the laughter six blocks away. It's like, you, you, come on, you didn't do that. And I said, yeah. So I just went home that night, pulled up the clippings from it, and it said, you know, Southwest FOB flies over Led Zeppelin, and it gave our names. And I just said, there you go, right there. Guys, I don't have to lie about this stuff. I don't have to make it up to impress anybody. We did these things. Well, you know, you and, you and Dan signed with uh, A&M Records, and then, you, then after three albums, you got released. 
I mean, how long was it, you know, first of all, why did you get released? And then how long was it after that that you landed the deal with Atlantic Records, which was really what the subsidiary Big Big Tree Records? Yeah, Big Tree Records. Actually, that was about two years, a year and a half after we left A&M. We just didn't have any hit records on A&M. Uh, Herb Alpert was a champion for us. He was in our corner, but at a certain point, when you're looking at dollars and cents, you have to go, guys, we're going to have to cut you loose. We just don't have $100,000 extra just to waste on it. So, and it's pure business, and I understand that, because, again, everything is the song. Well, you all, you know, you all released the album Nights Are Forever. So right. how fast did the success come? Because the first big hit was I'd Really Love to See You Tonight, which was written by Parker McGee. Right. Now, the funny thing about that is that neither Dan or I, either one, wanted to do that song. We wanted to be known as singer-songwriters. We wanted to have our own songs out there. And so far, I think I'd made like a dollar ninety-eight, you know, on everything written and so we're just kind of balking at it thought it was a female song and they said no just just do it just just try it so we went okay fine so we did a demo on it and uh susan our manager took it into the record company and because we had carte blanche in there because bob greenberg at atlantic really liked dan and i we just didn't have the hit yet they thought so she played him the song all of a sudden two guys come into the room and he introduces them as, as uh, the guys from Big Tree Records visiting out there. And so they talked for a while and Susan said, I'm just waiting for him, to, you know, these guys to leave so I can talk to Bob about the song. And uh, so before she was able to do that, one of the guys from the record label looked at Bob and he said, Bob, what do you think of that song she played for you? Bob looked at her and he said, Susan, he says, I'm sorry, I just I just don't think that's that that's the one. And so she's dejected again. And, and the guy says, well, you sure you're going to pass on that song? And Bob goes, yeah, Susan, I'm sorry, I'm going to pass. The guy looked at Susan and said, we want the song. They had heard it through the wall. Now, that's just too big of a coincidence, you know, but that's how that happened. And what was what was even more interesting for me was that, again, we wanted to write our own songs, like I said, but when I saw the check, the royalty check that came in from Really Love to See You Tonight, I found myself becoming about as mercenary as you could possibly be. I'm calling up Parker going, hey, buddy, hey, what else you got? Me? <laughs> you know? Well, you so, know, I had, you know, I went back and I looked at, every hit song that you and Dan did together. And I was amazed about something, of course, you know, with, I'd really love to see you tonight. Um, and even in nights are forever without you, they were both Parker McGee songs. Then sad to belong was Randy, uh, Goodrum. And then right. we'll never have to say goodbye. That was Jeffrey, uh, what, uh, Common. Commodore. And then, right. Love is the answer, which to me is probably my favorite England Dan and John Ford Coley song. But it was you and Todd Run uh, Rundgren that wrote that song. No, actually, it was just Todd Rundgren. Only Todd. I, I think I think Todd came into my dreams. I'm almost willing to swear to this, and he stole that song right out of my head. But uh, actually. The third song that Parker had written for us was called um, Where Do I Go From Here? Now, they wanted to put that song out, but there was another song that I had written called Gone Too Far. They said, let's figure out which one is going to be the single. So they put it on the radio. They would hold contests and Gone Too Far won out. So I actually had the fourth single um, that Dan and I did. We had four top tens and two top twenties. That's how we, I call it the six. Well, that's funny because you both wanted to be singer songwriters, but your biggest hit songs were all written by someone else. Yeah, I know. There's no justice in the world. I don't, I don't know how that works. Well, for, for you, are you surprised by the longevity that these songs have carried for decades? I'm surprised when I wake up in the morning. I think everything just kind of surprises me these days, but 
the great thing about it is the songs now, they really don't have any melody. It's just, it's self-absorption. There's just, it's all about me. It's all about my vocal. It's all about all the scales that I can do. The melody is not there for everybody to sing along with. Those songs you could sing along with. Plus they had a little bit of a storyline to them. So I, I'm not surprised. I'm just extraordinarily grateful. Every hit song by you and Dan, it, it's, it's a perfect, it's like you said, every song tells a story. Yeah. Every person on this planet that has ever heard these songs, they all picture what's going on in the song. Yeah. Because it, that's how clear the story is. I mean, I can, I can literally hear the intro of Love is the Answer. I can hear the piano. And that's what makes songs legendary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're right. Today's songs, they lack storytelling. Sometimes I think the fact that most of today's pop acts aren't old enough to write about life. And most of well, them don't have talent to write at all. But when you get right down to it, neither were we. We were just kind of feet on our way. But we, we fortunately were raised in a generation where we got told a lot of stories. So you were able to piece things together. I mean, you, you think about uh, uh, jumping off the Tallahatchie Bridge. You know, you would never hear anything like that today. You couldn't get past a three-minute song properly. And this, it's just a different time. Music changes. Everything, you know, just kind of works its way around. And eventually it kind of comes back around again. I remember there was a song that I had written for a film called uh, Major League Three, Back to the Miners. And it was the opening song. And so they got Mike Curb's record label because he was kind of involved with it as well he got a lot of his artists to sing on those songs so mike is standing there and i'm introduced to him and the guy is going to be singing the song that i wrote and we're like ships in the night i mean you know he's a suit i we just do not connect at all and so finally he's just kind of him hawing around and he goes so um you still in music and i thought Hands down, that's got to be the dumbest question I've ever been asked. And I said, yeah, I am. I said, it's kind of like being in the mob. You know, we take a blood oath. And he's like, oh, yeah, he's looking for a way to get out of there now because he thinks I'm nuts. And I said, I wrote the song. And he went, oh, okay. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> well, what, well, well, when it comes to songwriting, is it difficult to write a song for a movie? Well, the thing that was great about this particular one, because again, a lot of songs are, are called knockoffs. So they go, look, we have pictured brown eyed girl in for this spot, you know, by Van Morrison. Give us a knockoff of that. So you want to write something similarly uh, close to it. Well, there was one song that they kind of gave me and I went, okay, we'll just change it around entirely. And, uh, you start, it, it's amazing how things just kind of pop when you've got a situation that you're watching on screen. It comes very fast, as opposed to just sitting down and taking 17 years to write some songs that I've written. You know, it's just, it's a very fast process because you've got the story unfolding in front of you. Yeah, that that is, that's very true. Uh, I had a question pop into my head uh, because in today's pop radio, uh, which radio is probably not as strong as most of the online streaming services that people listen to today, but still in the end, today's radio, you would probably only hear about 10 songs on the radio and then they would just replay the same 10 over and over again. But back in the day, especially the 70s, to me, that is still the best decade of music. But when it was you and Dan having these hit songs on the radio, 
It was an extremely crowded genre, wasn't it? It was. It really was. So, so when y'all had, had a hit song, I mean, was it, I mean, you know, here you end up with, let's say, let's say you have a number one song and you beat the Rolling Stones, you beat the Eagles, you know, you're, you're besting Jackson Brown and the list goes on, you know, Bruce Springsteen, but you're sitting at number one. How shocking was that? Oh, it's very shocking. But also by the same token, you feel very proud because you feel like you're playing with the big boys. And I've got a couple of, of uh, geez, what are, they're like charts that I've taken pictures of. And it's Elton John and then Paul McCartney and Wings. And then this one, and then this one, and then this one. Then England Dan, John Ford Coley. Then this one. And I'm going, doggone, man. You know, just to be sitting there amongst that, that crowd of people, that's, that's something you can't really explain. No, because, I mean, think about it. The Beatles broke up, officially broke up in 1970. Then Paul McCartney and Wings comes out, and he he never missed a beat. No. Elton John was filling up stadiums and having hit songs. You know, the Eagles were coming, you know, they came forward. I mean, Hotel California hit 1976. And, I mean, to me, that is the, the decade of the, some of the best music. But what I also like that when it came to songwriting and music producing, there was more creativity back in the day running tape than what we have today with Pro Tools. I mean, what do you think between the the two, um, you know, they, they the contrasts are so wide. I mean, what do you think of the way music was produced back then versus today? Well, you know, it was a different thing with the tape. So you had some white noise in there. Now everything is very, very clean, and you had you had eight or sixteen tracks. You got up to twenty-four tracks. Now you've got unlimited number of tracks that you can put on there. Where music for me kind of started going down was they started having so many sounds put in. You take a keyboard, you hit a note, and it gives you know. Uh, bathtub stopper clanging on Harley bar. I mean, you know, it's a, what, what do you need that for? It's like one time I was going to play, a guy asked me to play for somebody. And I said, yeah, it kind of sounds fun. He said, what kind of gear do you have? And I said, a piano. And he said, no, I mean, do you have like gear? Because he's got a lot of sounds and stuff like that. And I went, you got the wrong guy then. I play piano with the little strings. I'm not, I'm not a sound guy. I don't want to mess with that stuff. For me, it's music. I don't need all those bells and whistles. And that, for me, now you've got so many songs with somebody coming in and going, oh, yeah, let's do that. And you kind of go, okay, that's that's good for like 30 seconds. But doesn't you know? that force the artist to be using a backing track on stage? I, I won't use a backing track. When I go out and I play, my attitude is kind of a jerky one. If you can't play, hell off the stage, okay? You don't have any business being here. Unless you're somebody that's really, really famous. Like I had a friend of mine uh, recently went to go see a very famous artist. And she said, well, he's like 90 years old. Do you think he was really hitting those notes or was he using tracks? And when he was using tracks, but that's so-and-so, who cares? You know, if it, if it was Joe Blow over here, it would be like, yeah, no, you just can't play. But that's, this guy's had tons of hit records, and he's still doing it at 90. Just go see him, you know. I went to go see the Stones uh, a couple of years ago down in Austin. Just got a wild hair, went down to go see them. And these guys, like you said, they're, they're nearing 80. But the most amazing thing was I watched Mick Jagger. Now, he's about an hour and a half into the set. And you can visibly see this guy starting to wind down. He's slowing down. And I literally watched that guy kick himself in the butt and finish that show up. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my life. And it was inspiring. Yeah, I think the older artists still know how to put on a show. I mean, I, you know, I just found out today that Bruce Springsteen had to cancel the rest of the year uh, because of an ulcer problem, but his concerts are four hours long. Um, Steven Tyler blows out his vocal cords because he gives it everything he's got, and now he's on a month vocal rest. 
you know, I think the younger generation of musicians need to learn something from these guys. Well, when you travel with those guys, I mean, I still, I, I admire people because they can still get up and do it. I was playing a gig in Sedona and a friend of mine said, Three Dog Night's going to be down in, in Greenville, Texas uh, the next day. And I went, well, heck, you know, I'll just get up early. So I jumped on a plane, went into Dallas, went over there because I wanted to see Danny Hutton because he was the only original singer left. Corey was, was wonderful. Chuck's hasn't been with him for years. Danny, 80 years old, he looks terrific. He sounds better than he's ever sounded before. He said, I do a show every day. I'm singing notes that I couldn't sing in Three Dog. And you just go, man, you know how to pace it. You know how to, how to talk. I learned years ago that I can't sing for two hours like that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to wear down. Even though I switch between piano and guitars, I tell a lot of stories. I tell a lot of jokes because I've got the stories. You know, I wrote a book called Backstage Pass. Most of them are funny because that's what I look for. I want to make the audience laugh and enjoy themselves. And... Uh, it saved me. It really has saved me. Well, you know, that's pretty smart. You know, um, it was funny. I just recently uh, interviewed uh, a recording artist that I believe now is, I guess, close to 90. And part of, part of their concerts were storytelling between songs. And I think oh. it does extend the life of the vo vocal cords. Well, not only that, it's very pleasing to the audience. I thought sometimes, you know, maybe they're getting bored. Maybe they think it shouldn't be, just shut up and play music, you know. But I get so many compliments because you tell them things that have gone on, stuff that you, that you people you've met with. It's like, you know, I used to get, uh, I told them the story about Cher. Cher was traveling with Seals and Crofts. We were doing a thing with Seals and Crofts. So constantly, all my, my career, I've been compared with Sonny Bono. Everybody thinks I'm Sonny Bono when they look at me. And I know for a fact that he got mistaken for me for a couple of times, which was really funny. And I tell everyone, but I didn't think that I looked like Sonny. And clearly Cher, who sat across from me having dinner, didn't think that I looked like Sonny either because she never said a word about it. She just kept staring at me, stabbing her fork into the table, but she never said a word about me looking like Sonny. So, you know, just little uh, things like that. But, well, so you bring up Seals and Croft. Yeah. Now, they were out at the, they were out at the same time as England and... And you, is that why Dan got called England Dan? So you wouldn't be called Dan Seals and John Ford Coley? No, actually, Jimmy Seals is the one who gave us the name England Dan and John Ford Coley. It was uh, Jimmy? Jimmy. Jimmy, uh, Dan used to run around mimicking the English accent. Now, if you've ever heard a Texas board try to mimic anything but a Southern accent, it's, it's comical. So he would do that and... Um, I've always had difficulty with my last name, Collie. I've been called everything but Collie, Cooley, Collie, Conley, Macaulay, everything. And so Jimmy said, we'll drop an L. It'll be like Red Foley yeah. and a John Coley. And he said, but we're going to add something else, a, a more famous name, John Ford Coley. Well, now he's talking about John Ford, the director that did all the John Wayne films. That was the second thing that hit me. I'm thinking about John Rip Ford down in Texas that won the last battle in the War for Southern Independence. So and Ford is a the stage name? Sorry? So Ford yep. is a stage name? Yeah, Ford's a stage name. My real name uh, legally is John Edward Colley. I was named after my great-grandfather. John Edward Colley. Wow. I learned something new today. <laughs> And so Jimmy, Jimmy, you know, they actually were just a little bit before us. But Jimmy was the one who helped us get things started, uh, took us into the same management company that they were with. And I mean, <laughs> I toured with Jimmy for years, you know, Jimmy and Dash. And it, it was, we had a lot of fun times. Well, when you're out, when you're out doing, when you're on tour, 
Uh, what's the most requested song that you get from fans? It's actually one of the six, uh, plus Soldier in the Rain. I always get asked for Soldier in the Rain because, again, they just want to see if I can actually play it, and which I can. But um, those, are the, those are the songs. People generally go down memory lane. They might remember something like, well, it's, it's like one night I, I didn't play a song. Uh, and the lady, I was talking with them afterwards, and she says, you know, I was a little bit disappointed in you tonight. And I went, oh, geez, what, why? What, what happened? What happened? And, and she said, well, I was hoping you would play Who's Lonely Now? And I said, you know, I would have played that song for you in a heartbeat if I knew it. And she says, what do you mean you don't know it? And I said, I don't know that song. She said, no, you and Dan recorded that song. And I said, no, we didn't. And she said, no, if I'm not mistaken, you and Dan wrote that song. And I went... Let me get back to you on that. We did. <laughs> I forget the song. You well, know? what was it? A B side? No, actually, it wasn't. It was an album cut. But I guess it got a lot of play. And uh, I, mean, I forget lyrics to songs. Somebody were, if they were to say, play, it's not the same, I'd go, okay, give me a key. <laughs> I haven't played that song. I think Moses was a prophet the last time that I played that song. You know, it's like, I don't remember all these things. Are you are you amazed how diehard these fans are? I am. I really am. Now, if you think it's that way here, go to some place like Asia, the Philippines. They know all of those songs because what we used to do is we would take the record, we would look at the liner notes. We knew everything on the, on those liner notes. In Asia, they still do that. They read those liner notes. They can tell you what musicians played on what songs. They can tell you the year that you put that song out, who the other writers were on that song. I find that just fascinating and that's the other element that today's generation is missing you know when i was yeah. a kid the greatest thing on a saturday morning was reading the back of a box of cereal watching cartoons but Absolutely. when you got to be a teenager it was buying vinyl records opening them up and then reading all of the inside yeah. you know like you said you knew who the musician the name of the musicians were you know who the name of the songwriters were it was like getting instant history on a vinyl record. And you can't do that now because most things are streamed. There is no liner notes. So you have no history on what the song is. Or, I mean, when you and I were growing up and we were listening to those vinyl records, there was the single. There was the one that got you to buy the record. But that normally was not the best song on the record. It That's was right. one not fit on the radio yeah. so it's it's true you know i remember the day when the artist would come out with a with an album you ran to the record store to buy the album you couldn't wait to get home and start listening the moment you drop that needle and and you listen to every song because there may have been one hit you know the first hit single being released yeah. But you didn't know out of the 10 or 12 songs on that album, how many were going to be released on the radio. And then when a new one would get released, you're like, oh, I got that on the record. And it, yeah. and it was it's like getting a freebie. Yeah. Now, the Beatles, you knew every song was going to be released or the Stones. But no, not not the other ones. That is fun. Now, well, why did you and Dan decide to disband as a duo? You know, I... I was just talking with Dan's sister the other night because everybody wants to know the dirt. Because again, there's always dirt. She said something about somebody and, and they said something and I said, listen, don't you worry, but I got more dirt on that person than you would ever want to hear. So you just, we'll just stop them right there. Everybody wants to know what happened. And I always say, look, if I tell you what happened, you're going to be getting my side of it. And Dan is not here to defend himself. 
So it would be very dishonorable for me to do something like that. The only thing that I say is a lot of people, and this happens to so many groups, a lot of people get involved in your career that should not. And they start influencing you in ways that you normally would have never been influenced before. You would just talk things out. But somebody's going, no, nah, you're the one. No, you're the singer. No, you're the this. This, you're the, and they just, you start to buy into that. And when I've spoken in colleges, because again, they always want to know, how do you do it? What can I learn from it? What, what do I need to know? And I go, there's, there's, you know, there's rules. Rule number one, if you're going to be in a band, keep your wives, your girlfriends, your husbands, and your boyfriends out of your business. Rule number two, keep your stupid, ignorant girlfriends, wives, boyfriends, and husbands out of your business. Rule number three, keep your dead gum, idiotic, don't know nothing, boyfriends, husbands, keep them out of your business because they, you know, the girls get in a fight. Now the guys are in a fight. And it's like, guys, we're here to make music. We got a year. We got maybe two years tops. You don't have time for that. Just go play music and have some fun. Yeah, and I think but, the poster child for that is the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, really. Because it, it ruined a wonderful group. Well, well, after you disbanded, and, and, I, and I completely respect the answer, uh, because I know that Dan passed away in, I think, 2005. And he, no, it, he had a he had a country, um, he had, he had like, a country music career there for a while. So, uh, but what it, led you to start a group with Leslie and Kelly Bulkin? Actually, we were we were friends, and then I ended up dating um, uh, one of the girls, Leslie. And I learned you never have a romantic relationship with anyone in any band or any other musician. Because again, at the end of the day, if you're in the middle of arguing about a song, clock doesn't stop at five o'clock. You know, it goes on. And so it just was not a healthy environment to be in. We had a great group. It was a good sound, but it just, it didn't take off the way that we were hoping it would. So we just bit the bullet early and called it quits yeah you should you should you should have taken a taken a note from fleetwood mac on that deal well yeah there's a lot of lessons that i wish that i had learned you know i wish that i could go back and there's a lot of changes i would make you know well how did you get into how did you get into acting because that, that was the 1980s wasn't it yeah like 1986 85 a friend of mine um there was a guy that was in The Godfather. His name was uh, Alex Rocco. And uh, we called him Bo. And Bo played Mo Green, uh, the guy that got shot in the eye on the massage table in Godfather. So his son was wanted to do a film. So he's pulling in all of his friends, Joey Pantoliano and Steve Rell's back and, and you know as many people as he can get in to work with him on this. I got called in. So I played the drums in the film, got bit by the acting bug. It was so much fun. You know, you run into a, just a variety of people that are very interesting and very entertaining. And uh, so I just kind of got bit by it and, and I did well. As a matter of fact, I would read the script and then I would just make up stuff. And they would let me go because a lot of the lines that I'm coming up with are better than the things that they had written. And I had I had a great time. Speaking of Springsteen, I met uh, uh, his sister Pamela Springsteen. She was in that film, and she had two days worth of work. And when when she and I met, we were like brother and sister. We were cloned at the hip. I mean, it was just like inseparable. And so she's going, John. You know, I'm trying so hard to get out from under Bruce's shadow. I'm working really hard. I'm studying. I'm becoming as believable as possible. Taking all the classes. And I'm just encouraging her. You know, saying just just hang in. You know how this business is. And so then the last day she's there, she runs over to me, and she goes, John. 
I talked to my brother Bruce last night. He knows who you are, said he would love to get together with you sometime. You guys could either write or you could play or, you know, even go out on the road or something like that. And he told me to give you his number. And I said, really? And she said, no, I was just acting. But did you believe me? <laughs> and it was just like, doggone Pam. I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> it's like, geez. So, you and, know. And the Academy <laughs> Award goes to Pamela. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, my gosh. That is that is the funniest story. But see, she proves she can act. She proves she could act. I mean, she had me hook, line, and sinker. But, you know, it's like I would write stories like that down in the book because it was, again, funny things to me are just so much better than all the depressing and who slept with who and who stabbed one. It's like, I really don't care. It's not that I don't care. It's just, I don't, I don't care. Yeah, but, no, I, I get that. But what, you know, now, um, what are you thinking about this incredible uh, resurgence of music from the 70s and, and even the 80s and all the acts, you know, you and so many others are back on tour and people are coming out to the shows. Well, there was a there was a documentary that was done recently called Sometimes When We Touch, the old Dan Hill song. And it goes through uh, three episodes of all of that. Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, Ambrosia, us, uh, just uh, Dan Hill, Stephen Bishop, so many different groups that, that have been able to have the resurgence on that. And then they came to the third episode and they said, and the reason why all of this happened was because of the rappers downloading and, and you know, sampling these things from the 70s. And I watched it and I went, you mean stealing it? That's that's what you mean. Oh, I'm, stealing, I'm, ste what, what do they call it? Stealing the beats, basically. Yeah, they they you, you can call it whatever you want to, but it's still theft to me. And then taking credit for it. That was that was the theft part. So they said that that was part of it, which I don't believe. I think the songs stood on their own, and the fact that because there were so many things that were not appealing to people, they were looking for music that they could relate to. Um, there was there was a couple of guys many, many years ago, back when I had a, an imposter, they worked for KOS Radio, KLOS, Mark and Brian. And these guys are playing all the classic rock stuff. And I don't fit in the classic rock stuff, but they had me come on the show. And so they said, yeah, we go out on the boat and, and we, we play all this music really loud. We play your songs really loud. And I went, well, that's funny right there to play my songs really loud. I mean, you know, how loud do they have to be? But that was the kind of the first time that I'd heard of that yacht rock kind of a situation. So it was, it's interesting the way that it's come back around. It is. I mean, when, even when I talk to uh, country recording artists that were very big in the 80s, very yeah. big in the 90s, on how they're getting a resurgence uh, and having these lengthy tours because people want to hear those songs again. Absolutely. You take, it's, it's going down memory lane. And it's very gratifying when you can think about this person. We're getting older, so our emotions are a little bit more touchy. You know, you think about old so-and-so and this person died recently and you go, good Lord, man, I remember. And you hear a song and bingo, you're just transported back immediately. So, yeah, it's more, more sentimental kind of a thing. And well, I'm, I'm, wait. No, go ahead. No, I'm the same way. I get affected by it. You know, I hear something and if I was moved emotionally, I mean, I think about all these people that I've toured with, that I've been around. We just lost Gary Wright. Uh, yeah, you know, Dream Weaver. And Gary and I toured for a long time. Um, you know, Jesus, Jimmy Buffett. Oh, yeah. I lose, I lose friends all the time. And some of them really hurt because you think, well, gosh, man, I remember when we did this together, we did that. And 
Well, it's funny because you brought up some names. I mean, I'm. I mean, I have all of these bands going through my head: Ambrosia, Poco, Toto, Firefall, um, Player. the The list goes on and on, and they're they're all into that same genre. You know, uh, Boz Skaggs. Right. You know, uh, like you said earlier, Dan Fogelberg. Uh, you know, well, heck, even the Doobie Brothers. I mean, the list goes yeah. on and on and on. My gosh, the Doobies are still selling out concert venues. Absolutely. Because, again, the music was really, it was timeless. It truly was. You know, and I tour with so many of those guys still. And it's it's just fun to get up there and play. I remember the last time that I played with Gary Wright. It, it was it was very uh, it was very heartwarming because Gary was seventy eight something like that. It was just a couple of years ago before uh, 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 COVID, and he can hardly walk. You can tell he's getting the beginning of dementia. He goes out on stage and he's just ho- kind of hobbling, and they're kind of helping him out there. And he's singing. He's doing his best. He sounds he sounds okay. You know, he's not the 26-year-old Gary Wright, but you, nobody expects that. But the audience was so kind to him. It's like they just wrapped their arms around him and embraced him. And you, that's very gratifying, you know, because, again, you're recognized for something that you've accomplished because there's not many people if you get right down to it, there's a lot of songs and records that are released, but not many people that really do something. Yeah, you, you know, to- the fans were the same way when Glenn Campbell went out on his very, very last tour and mm-hmm. um, and supported him. You know, if he if he forgot a lyric, nobody worried about it. They they. The, you know, the audience sings the songs along with the artist. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a, lot, I, of, there's a lot of love there. And, you know, sometimes yeah. I sit around thinking, what, what is the music scene going to be like 30, 40 years down the road when none of those songs ever created memories for yeah. a lot of people? I mean, they're, they're not as well written as they were during your time. Let's be real. <laughs> The thing that I look at, one, one, of my, one of the most distressing lines in the Bible that I've ever read is in Exodus. And it's in the first chapter. And here's all these things that Joseph did to elevate his, uh, uh, not only the Jews, but also the Egyptians. Right? And the line says, and there arose a king who did not know Joseph. And it's like, dang, we mm-hmm. all get, we all, I mean, you've, you've done these things, you've created, you've, you've sold out to hundreds of thousands of people, you know, sang in front of kings and queens and things, but there arises a generation that does not know who you are. And then they're replaced by somebody else that's going to be forgotten. It's very depressing. You know, I can, well, I, I, I will I will turn the depressing into something great because I know 1.7 million people who listen to those songs yeah. every month. Does that that's, shock you? I mean, it, I'm I'm impressed. It, it's very shocking. Uh, the one that really blew me away, and it literally sat me down, standing on the stage, was. They asked me to play certain songs in the Philippines when I came over. They said they're not necessarily hits in the States, but they were big hits here, and especially in Asia. So I am, they said, play these, these seven songs. And I went, okay. And one of them that I played, we had done for a film called Just Tell Me You Love Me. It was the thing with Robert Hedges and, uh, oh God, the, the young lady that married Clint Black. I can't think of her name. Oh, Linda, uh, Hartman. Hartman, Linda Hartman. And so I started playing this song. All of a sudden, they're singing louder than I am. And I was so amazed. And I'm pretty spontaneous. And I just stopped playing it. And I said, how do you know this song? 
Well, come to find out, every school child in Asia knows that song. And to this day, that's the biggest one. And I don't even sing it. I just let them sing. And when you've got those kinds of voices coming back at you, and you realize it's like, gosh, really? So that's, that, that hits you. I mean, you know, I get very emotional. I'm, I'm part Irish, man. You know, I cry at card games. So it's like, <laughs> it's just. I, I can, I can feel you on that one. I mean, I absolutely appreciate music history. And England Dan, John Ford Coley is part, uh, will always be a part of rock pop history, music history. Because, like you said, the songs are timeless. Um, I know people in their 20s that know those songs. So, you know, there are generations that are picking up and hearing these songs for the first time. And they're like, wow, that's a great song. But like you said in the beginning, it all comes down to storytelling. And that's what life is about. You can't write a song without life. I mean, you've got to live it. You've got to have experience to write something. That's the reason why I pretty much hate today's modern music. Well, there's some good stuff. I mean, but some. You, a lot of it I don't listen to because, again, it just doesn't attract me. First of all, it's not interesting. And uh, there's only, there's like a whole keyboard. There's a whole guitar thing that, you can play all over that thing and come up with something new. I like the newness. Now, the hard part for me going out and playing is because I'm kind of relegated to the past. I'm relegated to memory lane. People want to hear those songs, and I can't walk out and not play those songs. But it gives me very little time to play something new that inspires me. So, I'm again, I'm stuck in that situation well you could always slide in a couple of new songs <laughs> in the set but, but people don't recognize them they're a little bit more reticent to to really embrace it because again they need to hear it more so that's why it's good i mean we look at it and say look there's no radio to really put the songs on any longer so they're not going to really be playing well you know song. def i think joe elliott of def leopard had said it probably about a year ago yeah. and it's like why would we want to spend the money to come out with a brand new album when everybody just wants to hear all of the hit songs that we're known for? Well, it, and I agree with that. However, there's also the element that you have continued to progress. Most people think you've stopped. No, you're just not on the radio. You're still playing music. I mean, I come up and I play and I write all the time and I'll do a couple of albums and I'll sell them at the concerts. It's more gratifying for me knowing that I haven't stopped than having, you know, a, a million selling record over here. You want to continue to progress. That, for me, is what music is about. Otherwise, you just stop. And I've never stopped. Well, you know, it's kind of, you know, you bring up a valid point because, you know, let's say Rod Stewart, for example. You know, well, how many a great American songbook albums did he come out with? That was his way of progressing forward, even though he was singing songs of the past that many people knew from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Yeah. Well, I mean, we really don't go back that far. There were some phenomenal songs that were written during that time period. You know, I'll find myself, you know, periodically just, just a song will hit me from way in the past. And I go, gosh, especially old hymns, you know. You don't hear those anymore. And those things would drop me to my knees quicker than anything you can imagine. Because again, they were, they, those songs were written because they could not not be written. There was no publishing deal. There was no recording contract. The people had that inside of them and it had to come out. It's the same thing now. I'll play songs nobody will probably ever hear. It didn't make any difference. It's the fact that it was there and it came out. Well, I'll tell you what, John, what is next for you? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, mean, I get up and I just kind of follow the, the way things go. I, I look at it now and go, I've, I've accomplished a lot. I really have. I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm happy with that. You can always do more, but it's like, it's, it's time to let another generation kind of move forward and, and show what they can do. I, I don't have anything to prove. Well, you know, I would love to see some of today's modern artists, regardless if it's rock or pop or even country. Uh, I think some of them need to be teaming up with you to maybe, uh, bring a new spin to some of the, the hit songs that you and Dan uh, have been widely known for. I would like to see that as well. Uh, I, think, I, mean, I think it's a great album idea. I know that, that you know, people like uh, either Tim McGraw and Barry Manilow had both done, I'd really love to see it tonight. Karen Carpenter did uh, the, uh, the Parker McGee song, Where Do I Go From Here? Also, Ann Murray, um, she did one of the songs we recorded, Mark, Mark, Michael Martin Murphy, who did uh, What's Forever Four. Dan and I recorded that first. And I make a nice little joke about Michael, you know, because we used to play together down in Dallas. But, uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see some, some new blood. Yeah, and ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, many of you are just like me. You're part of that 1.7 million who listen to England, Dan, and John Ford Coley's songs every month. It's part of our life. It's, it's embedded into our memory bank. When we hear those songs, we can picture the story that's being sung, or we're living uh, with a story that happened to our own lives because we're hearing that song when something happens. And that's the greatest thing about music. It's memory making. And... Tell you the truth, it's music that in, improves our memory. So as you get older, just keep singing the songs. Uh, and for all of you out there to connect with all things John Ford Coley, you need to go to johnfordcoley.com for his music, music and tour schedule. So when he comes to your area, buy the ticket, buy the merch, and buy the records because that's what keeps it going. And John, I want to thank you for blessing us with your presence today and just uh, kind of giving us the back end story of your incredible music history. Well, thank you for asking me. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, again, head over to johnfordcoley.com. Check out the music. Uh, check out the tour schedule as well, because I know that he's never going to get off the road, which is a great thing for all of us. So... Uh, no, one, no intention. <laughs> They're coming off the road. I go constantly. If I'm not touring, I mean, I had my kids call me one time and say, Dad, we haven't seen your truck in a couple of days. Where are you? And I said, I think I'm in Maryland somewhere. And, and they said, what are you doing in Maryland? I said, I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. You know, I just go. Well, so. it's, it's like a friend always tells me, you know, you just got to keep moving. You know, you if, you, if, if you don't, if you, if you don't move it, you're going to lose it. And I know one thing about, uh, uh, musicians, they always keep moving forward and I am thankful for that. And again, John, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. You bet. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching. And as for me, I'll see you next time. And let me just leave you with a few words. Love is the answer. So look it up. See you next time.